It can be said that America is a collection of patchwork pieces sewn together to create one big united country, like a grand quilt. But we all know that's not the truth. Despite our melting pot status, we are mostly boiled down to having two distinct pills to swallow, red or blue. The country is in a divisional crisis not seen since the 1860s. And soon all of that fine stitching will come undone, and once a quilt has been used that many times, the only good thing to do is throw it all away and start a new one. Today we are going to have a conversation with two people that have done just that. They have started their own quilting project, both literally and figuratively, that is sewing together some of those pieces that have been bitterly frayed with brand new ones. These two Gen Xers epitomize the spirit of their generation, their adventurousness, their digital acumenity filtered through an analog intelligence, their DIY punk aesthetic. They are the final thread between understanding the problematic past while helping forge the unforeseeable future. Red State, Rockets, RV Resorts, and all things quilting are on the menu today as we head out on the highway with Teresa Coates and Jason Hawk Hamilton on this episode of Five Dollar Buzz. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Five Dollar Buzz. Uh, you know, I am joined today. My name is Roger, by the way, and I am joined as always with my co-patriots. First, we have George Cursar out in Connecticut. George, how are you doing this evening? It's a beautiful night here in uh, New England. I was uh, had some sake tonight recommended by our good friend Brian Clancy. Oh, nice. And Roger, I scored some tickets to see Gary Clark Jr. in two weeks, so I'm really happy. Very excited. I'm going to try to get you a meet and greet, my brother. I can't wait. And uh, we also have my uh, good cohort in crime here, Mr. Peter Liska, new dad out there in West Hollywood. How you doing, my brother? Oh, Roger, I'm doing great. Um, you know, I was just thinking a little earlier how... Uh, feeling the feeling the pang of excitement to get back on the mic i've missed a few uh you know we've been uh, taking care of our our new baby sienna and these guys have been uh doing the heavy lifting and just to be back out and uh and, and getting into one is really exciting for me so uh i'm really looking forward to this especially with these two i'm not gonna say their names yet but i'm excited <laughs> fantastic my brother so now i am going to introduce us to two people whom I know very well. Um, they are uh, a, a couple now, but uh, my, my, in fact, when I first met Teresa, uh, she was going out with Hawk at that time. And now they are together on an enterprise that I think is absolutely wonderful. We have Teresa Coates and Jason Hawk Hamilton. Um, we just call him Hawk. And the um, Teresa is, I think, on the precipice of becoming a modern day Martha Stewart, I think is what we're, we're, we're going with. She is a world class quilter to begin with. Uh, is it quilter or quiltist? A quilter. Quilter. A, a world class quilter, uh, probably the, the best in the business, as they say. And they have a road show that they just embarked on where they went uh you no know, explain to me how many states and how they traveled with an rv that had uh their the, the name of the show and Teresa's name on the side a beautiful silver rv uh she works with a company called shannon fabrics she's the face of shannon fabrics and they have a show called we uh sew together tuesday is the name of the show and you can also find a lot of their stuffs on Makers at Large on their Instagram page. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and say hello to Teresa Coates and Hawk. How are you guys doing? <laughs> We're doing great, Roger. Nice to see you. Oh, fantastic. So George, nice to meet you, sir. Mr. Yeah. George, I'm sorry. That's right. I appreciate your time, so, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Why, why don't you guys tell us, uh, Teresa, why don't you tell us a little bit about you uh, and how you came about. Why don't we just talk about the show and what you're doing and what you guys just did. Maybe you both can jump in. 
So basically, I'm Teresa Coates. I'm the National Educator for Shannon Fabrics. This is my little tagline that I get to say all the time. Um, we have been doing this show since the beginning of the pandemic, basically. So I got hired at the company about five years ago as the education person to like head that up. And now we have a whole department there. We hired Hawk a few months ago and uh, we started doing this weekly um, sewing class. And so we did a few before the pandemic. And then when I got brought home off the road, cause I used to travel and teach all the time, I got brought home and then we had to do something and I really wanted to keep teaching. So we started doing a live every Tuesday and I would sew a project on the fly. I'd kind of figure it out the day before and then I would just sew it live in front of everybody on Tuesday morning. And we figured we would do it for a while until you know people got bored of it and then people liked it and then the pandemic kept going. And so now a year and a half later, we're 110 or something episodes in. 111, um, I think. Now, yeah, because yeah. yeah. we've had numerous ones that are like multiple days and yeah, it's been crazy. And so. Yeah, that was, that was the nuttiness of how this got started. So we started doing this weekly show and then it's just sort of developed along the way from being this super scattered, crazy, nervous, um, um, um thing that we started at the beginning and now it's pretty polished. We have a team that works with us. There's five people who do it, um, who work with us, like including us every week. And, uh, I started getting asked if I could come back out and teach the uh, beginning of this year. So March ish, then people started asking like, when are you going to be able to come back out and teach in the stores? And I was like, I don't really know. Like vaccines were just starting. We're not really sure how things are going. Um, and so we kind of brainstormed this idea. And I told Hawk, like, I really want to do the show and I really want to teach in stores and I don't want to give up either one of them. So how do we do this? How do we make it work together? So he's the one who had the bright idea of putting together a whole pitch package is that what you call it? like a pitch i'm i'm not hollywood i don't know i just sew. like mm. <laughs> it's like what do we do and he was like i got this and so he put together this big thing and then presented it to the company and then they hired you <laughs> yeah yeah so obviously during the pandemic it was only she and i stuck in the cage of our house both of us were very much used to being on the road and then just coming back into our relationship Every couple of weeks, we would see each other for a few days, mm -hmm. and then we would both find our own separate ways. Next thing you know, we're stuck in the house together. How's that going to go? And we are not just sit on the couch and watch Netflix people. So we decided to make work for ourselves. So yeah, so we started doing the live sewing show. And then, like she said, once we were, she was being called to go back out on the road again. We had to figure out how to combine everything together. So yeah, I put together a, a PowerPoint pitch package. We did it live over Zoom with the owner of the company and all of the upper management. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, it was probably 15 or 20 slides. And uh, they bit so hard. <laughs> they did exactly, they, 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 they ran with everything yeah. that we pitched at them. I had budget documents laid out. I had um, uh, pr uh, preliminary artwork for what the side of the RV might look like. Yeah, um, it was crazy. Anyway, yeah, that worked out really, really well. We ended up with a better RV than we had asked for. Yeah. Uh, so basically and they, they hired they, me full time. Yeah, yeah. And they literally like bought a brand new RV and then wrapped the thing with our like logo that I had come up with just randomly and then put the logo on it. He designed like everything, the layout of everything. Yeah, they wrapped it and then they sent us out. Can we say how many places we went to? Well, no, yeah. what do you mean? We're gonna ask that, well, of course. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> so we ended up going over 9,000 miles to 22 different states and 16 different quilt shops. So wow. It was a lot in 11, 10 weeks, in 10 weeks. So it was just a bam, 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 bam. And like you said, like they kind of just bit onto everything that we were like, we could do this. And they were like, yeah, do it, try it. See what happens. They were like, all right, let's go. So it was crazy and super exciting. Um, yeah, we had, a, we had an awesome time. We're going to do it all over again, starting in January. Teresa, can you just, uh, for so a novice like me, can you explain how you became a master of your craft? <laughs> I mean, this is something that, um, maybe kind of like in lost art form, but how did you get interested? How did you become uh, the Jedi quilter that you are today? <laughs> well, I, uh, I started sewing when I was a kid, like my mom sewed, and my grandma sewed, like all that stuff. <clears throat> and then I didn't really sew for, like when I was a teenager, like I didn't care. 
as a teenager, I had better things to do. And then when I had kids, and I had kids um, starting at 22. And so that's when I was like, I had a baby. They need a quilt. That's what we do. So then I, that's what I started quilt making. Then I made them for all the babies, all the nieces, nephews, all of that good stuff. And, um, and I actually stopped sewing for a long time because my ex-husband really hated it. So then when I got divorced, I started up again. And now I'm just like, look at me now. <laughs> So I've just sort of like taken it on probably for the last about 10 years. And this is the industry that I've worked in. I just, I'm immersed in it. So um, yeah, I've worked in magazines and for fabric companies and in quilt shops and design patterns and written for various quilting magazines. And yeah, I just sort of, I just jumped. Yeah. I'm neck, neck deep in it now. Yeah. That's great because it seems like a, it, nowadays, like as everything goes digital, there's not really a lot of, uh, professions where you can work with your hands and actually physically touch things so it's cool yeah. that you know you're yes. still out there doing like the art it's like an uh you know a discipline like you it's been passed down and you're still doing it so it's totally awesome. yeah. yeah and there's something kind of cool about doing something that like like for instance i'm working on a quilt that my great grandmother made she hand pieced the quilt and then i'm hand quilting the quilt 50 years later. Um, and there's something really kind of cool about like the generational thing of it and like being able to help people learn how to sew and how to make quilts and all that good stuff. Like, I don't know, it makes me happy that I'm continuing this thing that's been going on for a long time. Um, yeah. And it, it also feels like one of those things that kind of transcends like time and culture, yeah. you know, it's like yeah. most places in the world you can find uh, people like yourself that are working with their hands and like creating something that people need and is going to be appreciated. So exactly. I mean, think of the idea that you're holding the same material that your grandmother held and working it. And, you yeah. know, just if you think about, if you can get lost in that meditative kind of idea for a minute, that's pretty amazing in and of itself. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's what, that's really what I love about it. I, there's something, yeah, that's kind of deep about it. And during that period, I mean, in, in growing up and, and, and having kids and stuff, you, you also found yourself in Vietnam. I did. <laughs> so how, how the hell did that happen? So you know, long story short, it's actually, I'm so glad that I ended up in Vietnam. And I'll tell you the biggest reason why is because that's where I learned how to, how to teach and that I love teaching. So before that I had been married and I had kids and then I ended up getting divorced and um, and then I went to college. So I kind of did things all in a weird order. And after college, I had been dating a guy and he had moved to Vietnam. And I was like, I would really love to be able to go. He didn't want to take me. We broke up. I really was super jealous of this idea of being able to just go somewhere and do something. And I had two kids, like, I can't really do this. And I thought, why the hell not? So I graduated, I, when I graduated from college, then I packed everything up. We sold everything we could. And uh, the kids and I went over and they were nine and 14 at the time. And we went over and volunteered in some orphanages there in um, a town called Temki. And then we taught at a university in a city called Tenghua. And I absolutely loved it. It was the best thing I've ever done. And it really did spark a thing in me that I realized that I love teaching. And then I ended up coming back and working in special ed. And then I got into the quilting industry teaching there. So it really was like a catalyst for me for a whole lot of change. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing, amazing experience. And it really was just me kind of being belligerent. Yeah, yeah. Because if you tell me I can't, I'll be like, watch watch this yeah i get that and then <laughs> and then uh you know hawk you know we didn't talk about hawk a little bit you know hawk is a he's a fabricator he's a sculptor he's a painter he's a, a very handsy gentleman so we say he can do all kinds of things um it, uh, you know hawk it, how your approach to getting involved with this other than just being there uh what you know your set of skills how does that lend itself to being a part of the whole process well let's start with the skill i didn't have <laughs> the skill i didn't have was running a camera or being a videographer on any level and yet that was i was the only guy allowed in the room so uh that allowed me to sort of approach the the idea of showing an audience what she was doing and how she was teaching 
from a, honestly a very naive point of view. We didn't mm -hmm. have a lot of fancy camera equipment. We had our phones and the idea was that we were brought, gonna upstream live to Facebook. Yeah. And one of the things that occurs with that technology is that when your camera, when you're filming with the phone, the live chat stream with all of the engagement is overlaid over top of what I'm videotaping. Mm -hmm which meant that I could read the comments in real time. Mm -hmm. And as I was paying attention to that, I was able to see what people were commenting on, what right. questions they had. And I could hold some of that in my head and find a way to work it into our conversation uh, or her her conversation, her teaching style. I'm just sewing and talking to myself, basically. She's got decent <laughs> banter or like patter, I guess, right? Like, like she's sewing and she's just talking through what she's doing and it's very stream of consciousness and it works. And I could just find ways of sort of interjecting our audience's mm -hmm. concerns. So that at first we only had one mic and then we ended up with, they couldn't hear my side of the conversation. And they wanted to, because they wanted ladies. to. And they were like, there's a dude in the room, we want to hear him. All right, then so, we see him. so then, we got, then we got two mics and then they could hear me and I helped with, with alignment <laughs> and continuity. Uh, and that was fun. So then move forward to, um, I mean, I've been on set and I certainly, you know, I've worked with some of our mutual friends, Burke Roberts of art directed and production designed. And I've been on set and around um, uh, that sort of equipment and that sort of mm -hmm. mindset before. So I had some experience with the overall concept, but not with this specific thing. So what we uh, ended up calling my point of view was active learner point of view. Mm -hmm. And I just tried to put myself in as vulnerable a state as I could for, and understand that I'm the audience. I have to be the audience for them to her. Yeah, it's been, it's been great because he does. He takes on like the, yeah, the total newbie. And so any of the questions he can like feed me and does that. I have to say though, that that was his skill that he didn't have. Doing this tour, this is not something I have ever done, like ever in a million years did I even think that this would be something I would do. And the idea is that we took our studio that's here at the house that we've been filming our live shows in, and then we stuck it in the back of the RV and had to set it up at a different shop every week. And so he's the one, like, I have to give massive credit to him because he's the one who understood, like, how do we do this? How do we set it up? And he gets in there and he sets everything up and knew what we needed. And like, we had to pitch this idea and then get all of the things that we would need. If it were me doing it, I'd be like, I don't know, I guess we need a light. Maybe we but, need extension but, cord. But therein lies, uh, therein lies something we can't go too much further without pointing out the fact that what you guys did was actually flip the whole idea uh, upside down and pitched your idea to the client first. If you think of it that way, most people take an idea and they go around to studios or, or producers or people that want to make a show. You guys went straight to the source of your job and, and you got the funding that way. And now, now, the, now the it's, it's limitless. It's, 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 I, I, that's amazing. Yeah. And it also is worth noting. I believe that Hawk, it, just from what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that you're, in the unique position of giving feedback as an audience. And Teresa, you get to just do your craft, yep. which is incredible. That's the most important thing. So it's kind of a really excellent little kismet situation you guys have going on here. It is fabulous. Uh, when it comes I, to the tour. Very Gen X. I, uh, oh, it's well, awesome, you know? Um, you're dating me <laughs> or you're aging me. One of those two things anyway. Uh, when it comes to the tour, I had definitely more pre-existing skill set, like yes. whether it was driving big vehicles or figuring out yeah. how to pack a truck or uh, running a spreadsheet and trying to figure out how to keep things organized. Um, yeah. that's, those are wheelhouses <laughs> that I've lived in before. What the real wild card was, though, and her bosses were all over her about this from the very beginning of the tour was, do you think you guys can like each other? under these circumstances uh, do you still like him uh, like is this it's like, a fair you guys question aren't like you aren't gonna like get into a fight are you <laughs> no he and i still liked each other so that was good <laughs> it, 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 it no matter how you cut it it's not easy to do this especially two artists you know endeavoring on the same mission i'm sure there's been it, it it's been something to navigate but it speaks to your guys you know real dream that you're following your dream that you're making it happen which is incredible yeah, I think it really helps that we we're both like 
we both have different skill sets that we're going into it. Like you're saying, like, he's the one who drives the vehicle. Like people keep asking me like, oh, do you drive the RV? And I'm like, hells no. Like, that is not what I do. I drive a two wheel vehicle. Thank you very much. Like, that's where I'm really happy is on my little 50 CC bike. Like, I don't drive an RV, but he does. And that's great because I'm really good at maps. So I navigate and I tell him where to go and he drives there. It's fabulous. Like, and I feel like that's the best thing about this has been, um, is this idea of being able to like, kind of just make it work because we're different in a lot of ways. It's been interesting too, because you're talking about two different artists being on the road. And that was one thing that we thought we could navigate better the first tour. And then um, we didn't, you got some paintings done. You got like three or four paintings. I think I I painted four, four very small oil paintings on the road. I certainly brought the gear and had uh, high expectations. Um, I thought I would finish my grandma's quilt and I didn't, not by any stretch. (laughs) She definitely put hours in on it. I One of my favorite things was driving down the road and looking over and seeing her four, four generations into this, this same piece of Americana. It was very American. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what, what are kind of the, when you're doing a show, what, uh, how big or how difficult or how, you know, the piece you do, do you do the same piece at every show or is it a different piece every show? And like how involved, how convoluted is it? You know, that kind of a thing. Well, it's really interesting because so every every week is a different project. So I'm sewing a different project every time I'm in a shop. So that was a lot to plan beforehand and have all those samples ready and sent out to stores and all of that good stuff. But every shop is different and we really don't know until we show up. And usually we would show up on Monday evening, but sometimes it was Tuesday morning. And then we would get to see how the shop was set up and where we're gonna be and what kind of space do we have and where the plugs and what's the internet like. And all of that was different at every single place that we went to. And that was, that was a lot to figure out. I think that's part of the challenge that I like in some weird way because I really don't know what to expect. So everything is different every time. And I kind of, yeah, I get off on that not being the same. Um, but it was, I think that that was, it was a good, bad thing. Yeah. I mean, it was intense. And one of the things is that we got, we got to problem solve every show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Li- basically live is certainly in front of the shop owner mm-hmm. and probably in front of uh, at least 50% of uh, the live studio audience that had shown up early uh, and was like banging on the glass in the front of the shop to try to get in to get autographs from this one. Um, which, by the way, the Super whole weird. idea of celebrity quilter is, it just blew my mind watching how much We're fun called. they had engaging mm-hmm. her. How so, size are these crowds? Celebrities. How si- what, what was the size of some of these crowds? Well, th- we've had, we had some tiny ones, which is true. But the biggest one we had was at Cali Coco and they had about 50 people there. Yeah. So, so I think about 20 is average that we had in there um, because well, one COVID precautions, like they can't shove a whole lot of people in the stores anymore. Um, but yeah, probably about 20, 25 is kind of average. The biggest one was 50 people. And that was super fun. That, that was, was our fun. initial, yeah. our first, yeah. our first show on the road was probably mm-hmm. our biggest. Yeah. So we started off with a bang that way. Yeah. And it really just depends on the shop that we're in. I mean, some of them, where was it? They, they had to like move stuff completely out. I can't remember. Somebody didn't have a classroom. The, the thing about a quilt shop. It's crazy. They're is all different. In my, what I'm, I'm learning is that, that they have a certain amount of real estate and the more merchandise they put in that real estate, the better their mark, their, their world works. Right. And some of them had classrooms and places to teach as a separate area. And some of them did not. No. So to try to set up a live studio audience and a 10 foot by 10 foot production set Mm -hmm. in the middle of existing chaos was, um, yeah, that was uh, putting, putting, um, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, uh, 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. Sure. Absolutely. But let's, let's ask it. So, but the real audience though, of course, is the ones that are watching Mm -hmm. live. Yeah. And then, so how big are those audiences have been getting audiences have been getting? Usually we're around 200, I think. We've had it up during the like the height of the pandemic when everybody was home. We've had over 300 people watching live, but um, I think it, roughly around now it's like 150 to 200. Yeah, it certainly, certainly yeah. tapered off as people went back to work. But what numbers haven't changed is uh, the rewatches or, the, or the, the watching. By the end of day one, it's pretty consistently five to 7,000 wow. views on everything. And we've got a couple of videos that are well up over a hundred thousand views on YouTube now. 
so and uh, her personal fan page, I love cuddle. Uh, uh, I love cuddle fabric, I love cuddle fabric mm -hmm. on on Facebook has well over twelve thousand members, uh, and that would that went up from a thousand at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. So, uh, I wouldn't exactly say we've gone viral, but no. man, we niched out yeah. hard. <laughs> <laughs> because it's you guys went out on the road in a really interesting part of uh, human history. Yeah. Uh, what was that like? Like, um, you're kind of almost going out into the unknown. Like, w w are there any places that kind of, you know, you're you're coming from L.A., like a major uh, art center and population center, but 22 states, you guys covered a lot of ground. Like, what was it like? What was the sentiment, if you can remember, of the people? And uh, what was it like going out into like some of the regions that you probably never thought you'd be in? It's probably traveled to some pretty yeah. interesting states that maybe you've never been to before, right? Yeah, some very interesting places for sure. I'll say I have been traveling and teaching like for four years now before that, that I've been traveling and going to these quilt shops, just not as a tour. So I would definitely still go to these quilt shops. So I've been to a lot of these towns before and they're tiny towns, like the most common ones are towns that have like 5,000 people or 12,000 people, two hours away from the nearest city. I fly in, I would get a rental car, I would drive out to the store. So this has been very, like, I know this. That's not how Hawk has traveled. <laughs> <laughs> my, my traveling for work has been very much in the biggest urban centers in the right. world. It's been traveling to, to China and Dubai and, uh, and all the major cities in the United States. And where I feel certain, a certain amount of anonymity and a certain amount of comfort. And that is absolutely not what happened on the road no. for us at no. all. <laughs> so I will say for me, it was not uncomfortable. I'm very, I'm very comfortable like showing up in these little towns and like people will be like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, Los Angeles. They're like, oh, Los Angeles. Where do you live in Los Angeles? I'm like downtown. They're like, oh my God, that's so crazy. But I think that I'm so used to that. I'm like, yeah, isn't that nuts? Like it's such a huge city. And, but Hawk hasn't had to do that little small talk before. And I think it was much more discomforting for you to show up in the small towns and wonder like what people are going to think and not really sure. And, you know, I mean, we're from, we're left leaning to say the least. And we went to a lot of right leaning places. So I grew up in a small town in Ohio. I grew up in a farming community on a farm and I graduated with 172 kids in a small community. And I certainly am able to speak to um, small town, middle America, uh, those folks. I was able to talk, the quilt shop owners, mm -hmm. oftentimes women, their husbands are oftentimes farmers was it was really easy for me to to work into that mm -hmm. but it was a surprise to them that I could speak with them yeah I think yeah. that there was a lot of initial apprehension I mean I've got a mohawk and I definitely <laughs> like the the LA license plates like all of this is a bunch of red flags for them so it took or maybe a, a bunch of blue flags uh, actually yeah maybe <laughs> maybe <laughs> point nice um so it took a little bit of extra effort on my part yeah. to break that ice and to get into real conversations mm -hmm. about, uh, with them and also to, you know, make sure that we're not talking about certain things. And it's not right. like an act of avoidance necessarily, but there are, there's plenty to talk about in the, in the, in the yeah. common ground. There's plenty of common ground. Yeah. So I feel like to speak to your question, the thing that I found was the common denominator amongst everybody that we talked to on the road was that Americans are skeptical right now. 100% they're skeptical of their government. They're skeptical of media. Mm -hmm. they're, skep they're skeptical of anything that comes through their screen. <laughs> it does not, it, it, they don't believe it. Yeah. So getting to meet me in person or getting to meet Teresa in person, we're from Los Angeles. What's it look like boots on the ground in Los Angeles? Her kids live in Portland. She right. can talk about what that looked like. Yeah. Hmm. And you watch them try to figure out how to change how they trust yeah. information. And I will, I will say that I do feel like there was some bridge building that we got to do because of that. Like, so for me, the, the example that stands out in my mind is the shop in Sydney that we showed up in Sydney, has, Sydney, Montana has about 12,000, 10,000 people. And um, we showed up there, have the, uh, the peeled off Trump signs on the window, like very clearly we're not in our neck of the woods. And um, 
And the first little meeting didn't, didn't go super smoothly, but not terrible. But I asked about the, uh, the oil rigs that were out there. And I asked him like, is that fracking or th that's not fracking? Like there was like this whole thing that they were like pushback. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm, I'm asking some wrong questions here. Let's try to do this dance a little better. By the end, she brought us homemade jam. We got to feed her pet <laughs> camel. Crazy. They took him out for a helicopter. I mean, it was like super crazy. Like the, like it started really weird. And then by the end we were buddies and like, we can't wait to have you guys back. It was like, yeah. It seems so, like, I mean, just the way you guys are talking, it seems like it was a super positive experience uh, um, considering the political landscape, uh, the skepticism and, you know, the backdrop of the, um, you know, uh, pandemic. But I mean, it seems like you guys had a great time. And we did. besides the challenges, <laughs> I could tell by the smile on your face is that it was, it was, you know, it was a great experience, right? Yeah, yeah. So much of a good experience for us yeah. that we made the decision early on that if we could work it out, we would go back out on the road. Mm -hmm. The quilt shops have loved us. Every shop that we went to has already expressed interest in having us come back. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the country that we could not go to on the first tour is clamoring for us to come and visit them, which we're really excited to do. So the announcement sort of is that December 14th is our last day here in Los Angeles in this apartment at the brewery. We are packing all of our stuff up into a pod. And the, if it doesn't yeah. fit in the pod or the RV, it goes away. And we are January 1, all next year, full-time road tour. Yep, that's crazy. Congrats, it's amazing. And the company is 100% behind it. They're yeah. down. That's that, you know, to let me know some uh, shops out in New England here and I'll uh, knock on we're, some doors. We're coming your way. By yeah. June, we expect to be in the Northeast. Yep. New York, oh. Connecticut, Rhode Island. Uh, Absolutely. We'll be there. New Hampshire for sure. <laughs> and definitely New York City as well. So cool, man. I, I think it's a perfect time to take a quick break, uh, guys. We'll do a little bathroom break, grab our uh, freshies, and uh, we'll be right back. Hey, we have a quick favor to ask. We want to get the word out, and the way to help is for you to subscribe to us on either Apple or Spotify. And it would be really huge if you give us a rating and a review. Much love. And we're back. And please remember to uh, follow us on YouTube, uh, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. And um, I think this is almost a tale of like the great American road trip, isn't it? Um, you know, just seeing the U S is kind of is great, right? Seeing all the landscapes, especially out West, but uh, what kind of music were you guys listening to out on the road? Did you get, was that an art? Do you guys fall on the same spectrum when it comes to tunes or what was that like? You know, for the most part we do usually, <clears throat> excuse me, usually when we're driving or when we're home or when we're doing anything, it's a lot of tool. It's a oh. lot of tool. We hit the road, and for yeah, some yeah. reason, I think it took us another month to listen to Tool again. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened, but it sort of disappeared. I won't say I was disappointed. She's been to a couple <laughs> of Tool concerts with me. Like she, she, she goes along on my ride a little bit. But um, there was a there was a palate cleansing moment <laughs> where really like was. we just got we went down. We went down the John Denver, Johnny Cash rabbit hole. I was going to say, we, uh, we listened, listened to a lot of country. The Highwaymen. Uh, I got a new recommendation, Ch Tyler Childers mm -hmm. out of Appalachia, yeah. who speaks to the race war and all mm -hmm. kinds of really excellent social issues. Mm -hmm. And he speaks in a way that uh, Appalachians will actually hear. And I loved his music. And we mm -hmm. listened to a lot of that on the road. Uh, yeah, we definitely just kind of went for American flavor. I remember coming across the high plains of Wyoming on the way home. And we had about 150 miles of flatland ahead of us. And there were huge lit up signs that said, if you have a high light vehicle, expect 70 mile an hour crosswinds. And I was Do like, not. is that us? Do is not. that us? And he was like, no, that's not us. I'm like, I think that's us. And I was like, <laughs> all right, you know what? I got full tanks right now. Everything's full. Black water's full. Gray water's full. Gasoline tanks are full. Go, we are go. as bottom heavy as we've ever been. We're running it. 
and we didn't have any music on at first mm -hmm. and I had to focus really, really mm -hmm. hard to keep that rig on the road. We were about 48 mm -hmm. feet long with the Jeep being towed behind us. And about halfway through, I finally got into my rhythm and I was like, Teresa, I need a, I need a request. I need, I need riders on the storm. Wow. Stat. <laughs> So I we basically you were gonna say like ticks that. and leeches. Uh, oh well, no, no, yeah. So we did. That would have that would have been a decent choice. But uh, yeah, we, again, it was just like I needed the mm -hmm. the the sentimentality. Uh, I I I wanted to remember the moment in a way that had layers. Mm -hmm. When I when I get in a groove like that, I I'll put on CCR's version of I heard it through the grapevine. All thirteen minutes and one second of it. Yeah. That's another good one to kind of get yourself motoring down the road you know yes that, that sort of rhythm you know oh like, yeah fortunate sun right now goes over like a lead balloon too <laughs> what do you mean i mean just thinking about driving driving through driving through uh red states yeah <laughs> so <laughs> every okay. classic rock station all the time is that what you're saying a lot of it yeah a lot of it. and uh, yeah and yeah. a lot of good good american uh country a lot of i think we listen to some some jazz and yeah mm -hmm. i mean oh, well we're which we're really excited yeah. next next tour we're going through this the the deep south and uh i'm hoping we get to hit new orleans yeah. and if that's the case yeah well it'll be all ragtime all the time word uh although ragtime's uh northern but that's okay that's a that's a chicago uh sound oh yeah is that yeah, true rag, yeah ragtime's uh total chicago that right. sounds like that sounds like a windbag to me it's a true story but I'm anyway sure it sounds like that sounds board. like roger knows something about something <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh yeah i mean new orleans is jazz new orleans is uh definitely a lot of jazz and a lot of blues and a lot of uh uh, you know, a lot of country. So it's, it's, oh, uh, yeah. We were at BB Kings in Kansas City, Memphis. Oh, Memphis. in Memphis. I'm begging mm -hmm. your pardon. Well, okay. So, that makes sense. City also, so. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Like, we were in Kansas City too. I mean, it really like it was hard to keep straight where we were. One of the things that like I think was interesting we did, like with the music, was we listened to a lot of music that we, we've known. Like it was, you know, 70s hits, good music that you could just sing along to and just keep driving for a long time. Um, but it's interesting because of that, like I tend to, um, remember songs in places a lot of times like I kind of like memories get made that way and it was interesting because there wasn't that with this like I don't have a song that I'm like oh that reminds me of that place because we listen to a lot of the same things over and over um the same like like four playlists that I did a lot mm. that were um yeah just good good Americana songs but it's interesting because I kind of want to do that next time and make sure that I like tie them into places I don't know you know what's awesome about uh, driving across the country is the different smells of every place you go to. I mean, even like the weird mills and all that stuff. I associate. I mean, I'll I'll walk, I'll get out of my car when if I'm traveling outside of L.A. and I'll smell something. It'll ri remind me of like the Pacific Northwest yes. or or yeah. Kansas or, or or something like that, which I always found to be pretty cool. Uh, yeah. As it were, George and I back in 1999 drove from New York all the way across to San Diego up to Vancouver and back over about six weeks. So we saw the whole country and, and it was in the fall as everything was changing, which was, I just really distinctly remember the, how special the smells of it. Each place was very unique. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. So in Colorado, you're going up there, you know, you get up towards the, uh, where the uh, Aspen trees, you know, when they turn the, the gold color in the fall. Beautiful. We were in Wyoming beautiful. when the Aspen trees started turning it, uh -oh. it, it, up in way up in uh, the pa pa black uh, powder river. Powder River, I think is what it's called. I think Le so. Le Leanne's place, the yeah. lodge. Yeah. 61 miles of dirt road to get to her lodge. Wow. Wow. That I mean, that's just like that's something, even if you never do it again, you did it. And you yeah. you, you have that. You'll oh, yeah, by the way, not in the RV. Yeah, not in the RV. Just <laughs> just with the Jeep. We left the RV in town for that, to be to be very clear. Yeah. You had that Jeep with you. What what did, what was that Jeep for? Uh Hawk? What did you do anything with that Jeep? Interesting. We drove it's 61 like, miles on a dirt road. <laughs> and it, well, no, hot, didn't you? Didn't you take a little side trip one day? You did. Oh, I did. I I bailed on the tour in Dallas. Uh, Teresa had a week of teaching classes in one spot uh, for um, uh, what was it? Uh, MSQC. Uh, OS OSQE. OSQE. The original one Show of those. Quilting Expo. 
it was big sewing ask expo uh in near dallas fort worth mm -hmm. and uh, so we left her and the rv in a in a an urban sprawl trailer park <laughs> and, also known as a resort which i will say rv resorts are not resorts it's a Just darn lie clarifying um yeah so but i stayed there I, I got to take three days and go uh, run uh run down a dream of mine mm -hmm. and i drove nine mile uh nine hours uh in the jeep down to boca chica mm -hmm. texas which is right near uh right near the rio grande river right near the mexican border and that is where elon musk is building starbase and he's uh, trying to get us to be an interplanetary species and trying to head us to Mars. Yeah, you can, you have politics to talk. I, I get it about, you know, paying attention to earth first. I, I, I got nothing to Cut say. Cut me off already, Hawk. Come on now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I think we could do a lot of things at the same time. <laughs> anyway. I got to go down there and explore my inner child for three days. I stayed at Rocket Ranch in a tent with the Jeep. And every morning I would head out and watch them build rockets with my own eyes. It was rad. The, the, the boy, what, man, I, I kind of had a similar experience. I mean, Texas, the great <laughs> state of Texas, man. But first of all, I fucking love Fort Worth. It's just such a great end. Dallas. It's such I love it. I don't know what else to say, but if you ever get a chance to go, you got to go. And when I was in uh, similar, I was in NASA in Houston and I just went in and was like awed by the rockets and like the, 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 um, like the achievement of humans and like, you know, from all different parts of the world, they came together and they built these rockets and they went to space and, you know, it was a positive vibe. Right. And then you leave and you're like, I'm going to put my fucking mask on and listen to the fucking talk about nonsense. Like, were you able to like capture, like, wasn't it cool to kind of like disengage from all that and just see what like human possibility is? You know, I think that's kind of what you're saying, Hawk, isn't it? It is exactly what mm -hmm. it was. It's exactly what I'm, I'm saying for, for me. I mean, I've, I've probably had two, childhood goals one uh, was to be an archaeologist the other one was to be an astronaut uh certainly had my share of uh, uh model rockets uh and probably very closely missed blowing off fingers numerous <laughs> times in my quest uh, anyway uh yeah it was interesting for me to see kind of zoom out and see what humanity at large might be up to because really what i felt throughout the whole tour was that Teresa and I were living our best lives. Yeah. That's great. Let me ask, let me get back down, just switch gears back to the quilting again, real quick. Yep. So <clears throat> Teresa, so, you know, I've known you for a while and, and I've seen some of your more ambitious or larger pieces mm -hmm. and some of your real arty pieces. You know, I know you do when you, when you demonstrate it's things that are going to attract you know the you know, a lot of average you know uh quilter yep to, to engage and be involved but tell us a little bit about some of your more ambitious pieces and some of the work you've done you uh, also worked with an organization where there were people who were doing quilts well if i can remember this correctly people that were doing quilts that um for a cause or for a reason you know there was something speak a little bit about that yeah, so um, I think what you're referring to is uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, we shared some quilts here that were from the Social Justice Sewing Academy, um, which is a super fabulous group that I've done a little bit of work with and supported in various ways. And they do um, sewing through schools and work with children to do quilting, which is awesome. Um, and then they basically go they'll have like different um, topics for each quilt, which I think is amazing. They also have this huge project that they're doing right now that I really wanna take part of and I just don't have the time to do it, which is the, um, the SJSA Remembrance Project where they have quilters across America who are making quilts to honor memorial quilts basically for people who have been killed by police officers. Um, and so the, they are getting like clothing and stuff from the person who has died and then making quilts from them, which is amazing. So I'm always happy to support them. So I have that interest that I, um, that I 
I've worked with them a little bit. For my, myself personally, um, the biggest thing is that I've been doing um, these American travels. Is that what they call it? American travels? Yeah, American travels quilt um, grouping series. series. There's the right, because I'm not an artist. I'm just a quilter. It's um, a damn lie. So full of shit. <laughs> but i've been trying to do quilts <laughs> no, i'm just gonna talk about the <laughs> so i've done a, a series of quilts i think i have like eight now and i have about 12 more drawn out um that are basically 50 inch by 50 inch um art pieces that are representative of the different different travels that we've done and so that's been really fun because it allowed me to explore different techniques and that's kind of what i've done with each one so far is i kind of tried to pick out a different technique to see um, what I like, what I don't like, what really sparks for me. And it's been, it's been super great. And I wish I had more time to do it. Um, but that's been really fun to kind of explore new techniques and then to explore like, what is it about a place that I really um, love or I would want to share with people? And like we did, um, one of them that I did was uh, a map of the Grand Canyon, which was super fun. And I did that in a whole bunch of different textiles. There was like silk and canvas and linens and cotton and um it was all raw edge applique and that was super that's like one of my favorites because it was just uh I love maps so I got to show that off yeah. and it was like a beautiful area and people know it from looking at it but then there are others that I've done that you can't really tell what the heck it is until I explain it to you like the concentric or not the concentric circles but the overlapping circles mm -hmm. um it's just called life cycles and you wouldn't know what it what it was until I explained it to you um and it has to do with visiting the badlands so that's been kind of fun is to explore it in different in different ways yeah I have a lot of drawings at this point and not a lot of time that I got to sew on the road because like we said I didn't really get to do that very much there was there was this idea that we would I would drive <laughs> up front and that we had a, her little featherweight quilter uh, sewing machine from 1940 mm -hmm. uh singer sewing machine it's this beautiful it's antique this big. that so is absolutely perfect seam mm -hmm. especially when it, her hands are running it and we had this idea in our heads that we would strap that to the table in the back of the rv and she would just sit back there and make 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 this is this is her brand we're gonna talk about talk about <laughs> what she does that's what she does I right make, there. I make, I make, I make, I make. Yeah. I have two. I have two basic questions. Very basic. <laughs> where do quilts? Where where do quilts originate from? There's a long history of them, and you will get arguments about where they began. Patchwork quilts tend to be more American. Um, oh, the word just escaped me that they use for basically like, you know what applique is where you would cut out a piece and then you smack it down and stitch it. Um, that's more how they were done originally in um, Europe and in Great Britain. And then America kind of took the patchwork thing and made it its own. It's not exclusively American, but it's pretty darn American. Yeah, but quilted things have been around since like 14 something. Well, so, so I mean, so it's European essentially. I mean, it comes from I mean, yeah. like they were they were they were making these back before the renaissance is what you're saying right right exactly but they would have been whole cloth quilts which are just a, two pieces of fabric that are quilted together so if there's really like there's all these variations on what quilting is so that's gotcha. what I mean. <laughs> and then and then one of your uh, one of these quilts that you're talking about how long does it take you from beginning to end to make would you say it really depends on what i'm doing so that if there was one quilt that i did that was um it's called reserved and it's basically um, a simple like road through this really um, desolate area of Colorado, Arizona. I can't remember. Is it Native American reservation? It's a Navajo it's reservation yeah. to the east of Great, the Grand Canyon. We gave them this land or we didn't, we didn't give them this land. We shoved them onto this land <laughs> under the, with the idea, hey, this is really pretty. You should live here. Right. Except that it absolutely is unfit for human yeah. uninhabitable at it's all uninhabitable. it's and it's just yeah. desolate so like it was one of the things that i kind of wanted to show in that quote was this desolation and just like this simple road that drove through it that was for people like me and him to just drive through so we could get to the beautiful grand canyon but they're stuck here in this desolation so it's really a lot of white space with a couple of mounds for the cement like hills that were there now when i did in the morning before work like it took me an hour and a half and then i sent it off to be quilted that grand canyon one probably took me because it was a lot of layers and a lot of stitching probably took me more like 30 hours um, a larger quilt can take you 
a lot longer and then it depends on how it's quilted so most of mine actually farm out to be quilted which is the part where you sew all the layers together so i'm a piecer or the a patchworker a topper um so i like to do the top layer that's all the pieced stuff and then there's and a backing out and then there's uh, the backing and the batting and i send you, it out to have somebody else do that and yeah. then and then my last question just on these on these kind of type of things is that is there a famous quilt or do you have a favorite quilt that exists that we might be able to like see or look up or something oh that's a good question i really <laughs> love the dear jane quilt um so the dear dear jane was a quilt that was made um I can't even remember the whole story about it, but you can find the pattern. I have the pattern. I have the pattern in various ways. And it was all hand piece and all the squares are I think four inches. So they're, they're very small squares for a quilt and it's just a ton of them. If you look it up, if you Google it, you will see all the variations that have been done since like 1850 or something. And it is fascinating. Every single block in it is different. Every triangle on the outside is different. Um, and I, I love, yeah, I love that quilt. I would that's say awesome. that the, the famous AIDS quilt. That, that AIDS. would, that would. Oh, that's right. That would that be. Would, that, that made it to pop culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Documentary and Academy Award nominated doc, I do believe. Yeah. 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 That, that was a big one. And then, I mean, it's like mosaic. It's, it's, it's art. It's, it's, a, it's almost a sculpture. I, you know, when I, I first met Teresa, when yeah. I, when I first knew the two of them were building a quilt out of jeans. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. was our first collaboration quilt our first quilt collaboration yeah this is where i was kind of starting to, to to break her into the idea that she's not just a crafts person that yeah. she's an artist that her brain works like an artist she has a craft and a set of skills that she does with her hands but it's actually what's going on in her head and her heart yeah okay. yeah and, it's a hard one and that's me. real Okay, so now we, we have that. a little special something here that we want to do. And Pete, I think you should. Uh, 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 oh, yeah. yeah? You yeah. want to do it? All right. I, th I think we should get this out. So, Teresa. So, Aunt Ruth is coming out here in a second. So, it just so happens Vanessa's Aunt Ruth is with us and she's helping us uh, with the baby. Well, you know, she's only three weeks old. And, I'm, and I just flippantly asked do, Is there anybody have a quilt question? You know, before I was about to start uh, this whole thing, and Ruth is like, I actually have a genuine quilt question. So I'm going to go get her. Awesome. And ask her genuine quilt question if Great. you'd indulge us. Okay. Right. Yeah. And it, while, we, right. while we do that, I'm going to ask uh, them a question. Okay. So the um, you've shown off uh, a lot of your quilts in various places. What do, do quilts end up in museums? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. One? I mean, what, what are some of the bigger pieces that, and have you represented yourself in a museum? I have not. That is a while down the road, but I have several friends who have. Um, one, um, so Bisa Butler is one who's getting a lot of uh, fame right now for her quilts, and she does a lot of the African-American uh, people quilts is what they are. Um, so they're figures, and she was at Chicago. You got to see her exhibit. She's going to, um, she's a big exhibit at the Boston Museum of Fine Art right now. Um, and her work is beautiful. Another one that is um, an industry friend of mine is Sean Kimber, and she is amazing. Um, and she does a lot of political quilts and she's got some, she, yeah, she has some that are just amazing. I, um, I met her when she did a quilt and um, it was very simple, just a big, a big square. And in the middle, she just has the words written legit rape happens here. And um, it was all about marital rape. And that to me was a moment that I was like, oh, and she had it displayed on a bed and the whole bit. And I was like, wow, that's, that's oh, a whole level of Jesus. quilt making that I hadn't really thought of. Um, she has several that are just beautiful. She has another one that um, is for Eric Garner. So the right name, right? And it says, um, I can't breathe. And it goes from being white down to blue as it fades off the bottom of the quilt. Um, are you talking about uh, Eric Garner or Floyd? No, I'm Eric, the one who was selling cigarettes. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. That, that was his yep. name. Um, though, though it's good to remember all of their names. Yeah, and she's done a bunch of them. Um, I'm just a sophisticated cotton picker. She has another one that's just tiny little squares of cotton. And that um, she has a lot of them that are very subtle political 
ambitious quilt. Um, yeah, her name is Sean Kimber. She's one of my favorites. Yeah. So I think we have Aunt Ruth on board. Aunt, Aunt Ruth, are, are you there? Maybe I'm put, here. Put the Hi, everybody. Hi, Aunt Ruth. <laughs> Can you put the microphone closer to you a little bit? Welcome. Yeah, I'm a little short. All right, here we go. Okay. okay. So you got a question for uh, Teresa. Go ahead. Shoot. I do. I do. On my dad's side of the family, my grandmother, Rosella, um, was from Illinois, Missouri area. And she did incredible quilts. Um, unlike anything I've ever seen before, and we have one of them. It's a full-size quilt. It looks like a daisy pattern, but unlike a lot of the daisy patterns that seem to be just in one square mm -hmm. and then they're separate, mm -hmm. these daisies completely kind of intertwine with the others. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle, the way they come together. And it's beautiful. And it was made from um, my dad's pajamas, you know, family members, yep. dresses, things like that. Yep. It's still in great condition. Mm -hmm. but the question I had is that um, my daughter, who's very interested in, in just about anything related to knitting, sewing, whatever, she's good. But we both have been wondering how we would take the way my grandmother left it was whenever there was a wedding or there was a baby born, she would take the already made front part of it. And then she lived on a farm. So she would use down and then she would hand, it was all hand sewn. So she would hand stitch the two parts together. Right. Um, but, but we actually have the edging that looks kind of like the end of the daisy. Uh -huh. So we're like, it's a slightly bit frayed. So we're just not badly, but we're trying very hard not to make it fray anymore. So right. that was my question. <laughs> how to get it to not fray anymore. Yeah. And how to combine the two pieces together the way she did, because it's a little bit more delicate than it was, of course, back in 1934. Right. Mm. So this is the conundrum that those of us who love quilts face mm -hmm. um, is that fabric doesn't last forever. Mm -hmm. So if you want it to last forever, you kind of got to stick it behind glass and never look at it and never, you know, let it near the sun and never touch it. Right. I will tell you that as a quilter and the quilters that I know, what we want you to do is use it until it's dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that was my mother's <laughs> attitude, you know, why stare at something when you can right. make use of it, you use know? it. Yeah. Um, so I would say use it. If you really <laughs> want to try to get it to not fray anymore, there are some products. There's one called Fray Check. Um, okay. And there's another called Fray Block that you can add to the edges of it and add to the fabric and it'll sort of stabilize that. Um, okay. You can also put stuff behind it to back it, add another layer of mm -hmm. a fabric like um, Batiste will um, is a really thin layer of cotton that you could put behind it to kind of yes. build it. Um, I would say take a lot of pictures and then just use it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Have Putting it together is, is just, it's going to be the jigsaw. Yeah. If she did it all by hand, it was a lot easier by hand than doing it by machine. Yeah. So. And it's a full size mm -hmm. uh, quilt. It's beautiful. But yes. anyway, I bet thank it you sounds so lovely. much. You're very <laughs> welcome. You've done some, you've done some basically like some restoration or some recovery work on some, some vintage quilts though, mm -hmm. right? Where like, it's it might be it might be possible depending on what the damage looks like right now or the wear right. looks like right now you might yeah. be able to to rebind it and that right. might be able to to give you it could, some if more it has the scalloped length. edge is what it sounds like uh, then it I does would, yeah it does. then oh, you yeah. could really add anything to it it's just kind of there right. um i know i got my i got another one of my great grandmother was a very prolific quilter and so i got another one of her quilts that she had actually used on her bed and her daughter who's now probably 75 wanted me to fix that quilt so that she could use it right the truth is there's no way to fix that quilt besides to rebuild the quilt to look sort of the same Grandma mm -hmm. used that quilt for a long time. So sure. it's been, you know, it's been loved to death, but honestly, like that's what we make them for. Like right. we make quilts because we want people to use them. So right. try not to feel bad about it. Cause it's one of the <laughs> things that drives people crazy is when you spend all this time making someone a beautiful quilt and then they just want to store it. So don't do that. No, just no, use I'll it. use it. <laughs> put, some, put some fray check on it. Yeah. yeah. Like 
try to try to be gentle with it. Make sure that Definitely. you're washing it like super gently. And if you can do things like where a lot of times like vintage quilts, they you wash them in the bathtub. So you're not actually agitating them. You just kind of squish right. them in water a bunch. Um, you can make them last longer. There are actually like, you know, quilt preservation um, groups and stuff like that right. that will help you. But really, if it's a family quilt, just love it. Just love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. If it's a piece of art, you put it Thank on you. the wall. I, right. We've been thinking of doing that. And you I absolutely think absolutely can. The important thing to us is to be able to look at it, enjoy it, pass yeah. it down. I mean, yeah. we don't have to go jumping on the bed and stuff. <laughs> We've got nine children in that family, so it would get a workout. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Hang it up. They have they've like um wall, what would you call it? Like a, a rod that you can hang it over, like getting right. something like that where you could actually right. have That's it on the That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it has never been used. It was okay. the original one that was kept in the hope chest the whole time. Ah, see? Hope chest, and, where quilts uh, go to die. Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Pleasure. Ruth, thank you so much. That was it was good to meet you all. Thank you. <laughs> good to meet you. <laughs> thank you, Peter. <laughs> so I think we are uh, thank you. Thank at you. that point now. We're about to wind down, guys. I want to thank our, uh, our, our guests tonight. I think that was, an, uh, this has been a, a fun and different experience for the, we call ourselves the buzzards. So it's uh, it's different for us to uh, have something um, a little more uh, uh, genteel, shall we say. So we, we've had some <laughs> more domesticated. Yeah, we, well, we've had some episodes this season on uh, fatherhood and motherhood, which were quite fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um so we, we've kind of changed it up. It's not all, you know, bang, 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 punk, rock, rock and roll, fuck you kind of a thing. You know, we, we do that. But this is uh, we've been running and gunning on uh, some episodes that have uh, challenged us. So we're called five dollar buzz. So we're about to do our third pot episode. So do a lot of stuff on pot. Um, but this is uh, this this is great. It's been a, fan, a, a fantastic episode. I want to thank you both. And then. Uh, any last thoughts, George? Yeah, uh, Teresa, just a real quick question. If, if we got uh, time is like, you're giving all this positive energy out to these people. And uh, what has it been like uh, on the receiving side? You know, you're, you're doing this work and you're getting this response and you're getting an audience. Like, what has that been like to kind of maybe Fierce. some strangers are reaching out to you and affecting your life in a, like, it's been really seem? weird. Yeah. <laughs> My biggest takeaway is it's just odd. It's not something that I've ever, um, I don't really like being recognized or I don't like being the center of attention. Um, so it has been very weird to me. Um, but it has been really lovely to be able to feel like I'm making a difference. So I think that's to, you know, link back to what you're talking about, like with other podcasts about like motherhood and stuff like, you know, mothering is this thing where like, I got, I raised my kids and like, I could see like the effect I had all the time. And like the kids are grown now and I get to see an effect that I have. And you feel like, all right, I made a difference. And I feel like I have kind of a similar thing weirdly with the quilt community or with the sewing community is that like, I can see like what I'm doing actually has an effect on people when they like leave comments for me or they send me emails. They say, thank you so much. Like, I'm not afraid to do this anymore. And I'm like, all right, great. Like, that's what I want. I want you to be happy and try to pursue this and do this thing that will bring you joy. And so if I can do that a little bit, it's wonderful. I will say it's still, it's odd. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think it's awesome. And you're uh, giving people something and uh, especially nowadays, it feels like people need something. And it seems like you guys uh, you know, especially coming from like big city, Los Angeles, right. we're able to let everybody know that everything's, you know, hopefully going to be okay. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we're doing it through quilting or podcasting or whatever it's going to be. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I just really feel a lot better that you guys were able to go out and do that. And, you know, everyone's happy and everyone's feeling good. And it, it wasn't like, Hey, everyone's an asshole. And they treated us like, no, you know, no, like not even close. Cause we were, from LA and had a mohawk and we, we, we didn't really fucking wear Donald Trump jerseys out everywhere or, or whatever yeah. it might be. So, You're yeah. going to be okay. The soul of America is intact. We saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Say the fucking words. 
Pero... You're gonna be okay. <laughs> <laughs> a Reservoir Dogs reference there. Pete, any last words? I, I just want to thank you guys. That was an awesome uh, taking us to your your tale there. It was absolutely awesome, and uh, you know, just that you're proving and you're and you're letting people know. I hope a takeaway for a lot of people that would listen to this is that you know, get creative. You can do your thing. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter. Just do it. Look at, just jump in and yep. do it and look at what, look at what happens. It's so fulfilling. It doesn't, yep. it doesn't matter. It's that's more riches than you could ever have. So I, I, I really thank you for that very much. Thank you. Welcome. Wants to take us out. George, okay. you want to take us out? Roger. I think you will. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for this, uh, uh, um, God damn it. What am I going to do? I want to thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of $5 Buzz. And just remember to hit that like button, subscribe button. If you have any questions, comments, or any ideas for future episodes or other uh, guests, please email us at $5 Buzz. And that's F I V E D O L L A R B U Z Z at gmail.com. We will get back to you as soon as we can. As soon as we're done putting our quilts together. Thank you yes. so much, everybody. And have a wonderful, beautiful day. Salud. <laughs>